Here in Southern California, we're very fortunate to be near a truly remarkable institution whose name tells you exactly what it is, City of Hope. The world-renowned Cancer Center is doing exciting and innovative work in research and treatment of cancer and other life-threatening diseases, and a leader of that effort is joining us now. We are honored to welcome Dr. Alexandra Levine, Chief Medical Officer of the City of Hope. Doctor, welcome to our show. We are honored to have you on board. Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Well, let's let's catch a few people up here. What is the City of Hope? The City of Hope is a National Cancer Institute sponsored center that cares for patients who have cancer, diabetes, and HIV AIDS. We are a major treatment facility. We are also a major research facility. Now, one of the areas where a lot of exciting research is going on right now in cancer treatment includes the idea of the mind-body connection. Let me get your viewpoint on what exactly that means. There is a real relationship between fear and stress and doing better or worse with any illness, including cancer. I think it's important to understand that stress does not cause cancer or other diseases per se. On the other hand, if an individual is frightened and worried and out of sorts and uncomfortable in your own skin, if you will, you just don't do as well with whatever that illness might be. And what we are trying to do at City of Hope is to develop an institution which is warm and caring and really does deal with all of the aspects of life that the patient is dealing with in an attempt to work with those other kinds of support mechanisms to get rid of the stress and to allow our treatments to work better. We're doing a lot of research in that area as well, trying to prove what those relationships are between peace of mind and doing better, or fear and fright and doing perhaps a little bit worse. So everything that we're doing in that regard will hopefully benefit our patients who are here, but also benefit patients all over the world as we publish the results of the studies that we're doing. So a point of clarification, emotional states like stress are not necessarily risk factors for cancer. That's a misapprehension. That's it exactly. The cause of cancer is extremely complicated. Cancer is not one disease, but many, many, many different diseases. If there's any one commonality, what's happened with cancer as it develops is an error of some sort at the level of the DNA. One cell in the body, perhaps a stomach cell, gets the wrong message from its own genetic information, from its own DNA, and starts to divide and divide for no reason at all and doesn't know how to stop. And that one cell takes off and takes over the normal function of that organ, can spread to another area of the body and so forth. So there's been an accident, if you will, an error in the DNA of a given cell. Now, no way in the world that stress can actually cause an error in the DNA, in the genetic information or the programming of the cell. On the other hand, the body is so complicated that there are all kinds of chemicals that are related to stress and anxiety and fear, and those chemicals can have an effect on the way a cancer cell may behave. And I think that's one of the concepts here. Well, knowing that can lead us to some breakthroughs here. What are some of the benefits of using mind-body strategies while someone is undergoing cancer treatment? I think one of the things you just said there is the key. Under no circumstance am I saying that the patient has to choose one modality versus another, chemotherapy versus mind-body. The idea is to take the best of every world toward the treatment of that individual. We have all kinds of interesting experiments and interesting day-to-day support that is given to the patients. At City of Hope, we have something called the Biller Patient and Resource Center, which is responsible, really, for implementing all of the support. And when a patient first comes in to us, they are given a screening tool. And it takes about 10 minutes, but the patient is asked, for example, do you have pain? And if it's a little laptop computer, it's a screen that comes up, and if the patient presses, yes, I have pain, the next screen that comes up says, do you want to see somebody about that? And if the patient says yes, that goes right into the computers, and the pain doctors will be there to see them. Are you worried? Are you anxious? Are you depressed? Do you have somebody to help you take care of your family? 
Do you have issues with transportation? A whole variety of issues impact the patient and how they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're trying to say to the patient, you are our partner. We are working together. And together we're going to get this thing solved. Tell me what you need and we will provide it to you. Well, does this approach actually influence cancer survivorship? That's one of the things that we will be studying. And we're actually looking at two things. Number one, does this kind of approach improve how you feel, the quality of survival? And the second question is, does this kind of approach improve the quantity of survival? I don't know the answers, but in my gut I do. No question in my mind that if you are dealt with as a member of a team as opposed to a foreign individual, we're going to act on you as opposed to working with you, I have an idea that the patient is going to feel better and that the quality of survival will be better. Deep in my heart, I also believe, based on my own experience over 40 years of caring for patients, that in fact the quantity, the amount of survival time will improve as well. And it's kind of interesting, you know, what is seen as helpful to one given person versus another. And I don't think there's any one answer. We each have our own areas of comfort or our own comfort zones, if you want to think about it in that way. Some people will find that comfort and peace by going to a support group by going to a psychiatrist, by going to church or temple. My own personal thing, frankly, would be to go to the beach. The sound of the waves relaxes my soul. And what we're looking for in each individual, what is that element that will, quote, relax your soul? And that's what we're trying to achieve, and that's what I think will be helpful as we go forward in trying to treat cancer better. Now, another thing that works hand-in-glove with this kind of thinking is support groups. How important are they during treatment? It's an individual answer, to tell you the truth. I have some patients who are exceedingly helped by support groups. They feel by sharing they're not all alone. There are other people who have gone through the exact same thing. They can be supported in that way far better than they could in many other ways. But there are other people who just aren't comfortable opening their souls to a group of three strangers or five strangers in a room. So that's a good example of the fact that there's a whole menu of opportunities there. And one of the options on that menu is a support group and could be extremely helpful in some people. There were a series of experiments done at Stanford University years ago in which support groups, either going to a support group or not going to a support group, was studied. And these were women who had breast cancer. They all had the same level of breast cancer, if you will, the same stage. They were all getting the same treatment as far as chemotherapy and or radiation and hormones. The doctors were the same. And within that context, half of the women were randomized to attend a support group once a week, and the other women had all the same care but did not attend the support group. And it turned out on that study, which was reproduced several times actually, the quality of life was much better in the women who went to the support group. They felt better, they expressed less pain, they felt less fear. When it then came to the question of prolongation of survival, it turned out that the women who attended that group lived a significantly longer period of time. There are many additional studies that have looked at the same kind of question. Some of the studies have reproduced that, i.e. shown a definite improvement in survival. Other studies did not, but even in the studies that did not show a lengthening of survival with the support group or the other type of support, they all showed an improvement in quality of survival. So I feel very strongly that the human aspects of care are exceedingly important. And a support group would be one way to help many people. And my only point in expanding the conversation is to say that there are a lot of other interventions out there that may speak more easily to a given patient versus somebody else. Dr. Levine, thank you so much for joining us here on Sky Radio. What a very human and humane approach. 
Thanks so much. Dr. Alexandra Levine is Chief Medical Officer of City of Hope. We reached her at the facility. City of Hope is on the web at www.cityofhope.org.